Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'in ashar wa la ilaha illallah wa atala shurikallah wa ashar muhammadin abduhu wa rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen hu aladhi jalan muslimin Did you think this was going to be in English? <laughs> My name is Yusuf, can you say Yusuf? First time, you get it right. All these years, my wife still pronounces it useless. <laughs> Could be a speech in peppermint. I'm not real sure about that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, it's great to be with all of you here in Dubai. This is a good chance for all of us to come together for the sake of getting true knowledge out about a very important subject. And what a better place to do it than Knowledge Village. Make sense? And Along the way, they said, let's talk about the chaos that's happening around the world and how we can deal with that as Muslims in the, in the West of all places. And we were just talking about that with the folks from the Dubai television. And one of the things that we were talking about is suppose we took a microphone and a camera, went out to the streets, you know, like Chicago, New York, Miami, something like this, you know. And you walk up to people and you say, look, I want you to finish this sentence for me. I'm going to give you just a short little sentence. Give me one word, the end of the sentence. You choose the word. All Muslims are... Now, what do you think they're going to say? <laughs> Peace-loving individuals? <laughs> Maybe not. Or ask them, Islam is... Finish the sentence. Islam is, is, yeah. Yet at the same time, and I'm talking about the news, today's news, because we have a news website that we've been running for the past several years, presenting news from our point of view, news that we need to know about. And one of the things that's in today's news right now is about a man, an elder man, who is charged with, I forget how many cases of rape. Many cases of rape. And they said likely would be a lot more, except it's past the statute of limitations. In other words, after so many years, you can't bring it up against somebody, no matter what they did, except, I think, murder. And this man, very old, imagine this, cut down on the number of rapes after he had his last heart attack. And this morning, they found him dead from suicide. Well, if that was all it was, that's not even mainstream news anymore, except the fact that his son is also being charged in a murder case of his girlfriend being strangled to death in the bathtub after she told him she was going to leave him. And the question that they have, and this is all the talk shows, you know, the talking heads, here's the question they have. Whether or not, this is very important, whether or not this is a genetic thing, you know, that it runs in the family. That's pretty chaotic to me, to imagine that that's the only thing you care about in the face of how many women have been violated out here. What about that? And what about the family of the victims, especially this girl who's just been murdered? The direction that our news is taking bothers me a lot because it seems like they, maybe in, uh, intentionally, maybe unintentionally, they missed the main point. And let me give you a couple other examples. They're hitting a lot closer to home. When we find in some places in the West that if a lady is seen following the Sharia, well, a man for that matter, they want to arrest them. Have you heard about this? Murfreesboro, Tennessee, just a couple weeks ago, tried to pass a law. If anybody is following Sharia, they could be arrested. And we were wondering right away, what do they mean by that? In other words, if I pray five times a day, I can go to jail?
And why all of a sudden Sharia is a bad word to them? What's going on with that? Now you can have a long beard, you know, because all the hillbillies and all the guitar bangers, okay, they got long beards, so that's okay. That's not a big problem. But if a lady wants to cover up, especially if she wants to cover her face, okay, that's it. That's it, man. What are you covering your face for? You better have a doctor's written excuse to cover your face. Huh? But if she wants to uncover stuff, hey, that's all right. In fact, we like to encourage that a little bit. <laughs> and uh, I really feel strongly about this because I grew up with women livers all around me, okay? Uh, I was raised by my mom and sisters. So I understand their point of view. And one of the things that really bothers me is the way that men try to sell women on the idea that, hey, what we're doing is good for you. Uncover some more stuff. Hmm? It's good for you. Selling them makeup, clothes, whatever you wore last month, it's no good anymore. You've got to have new stuff to show off, to show off, to show off. Because if you don't look right, we're not going to approve of you. Everything for a woman has to be her look. She has to look good or she's an outcast. That's it. Imagine that. And God forbid that she should have any kind of infirmity. Something like, let's say she is missing one eye. Okay, that's it. Or that she limps when she walks. Ugh. Because it's all about looks, nothing else. Nothing else. Is that a problem? I think that is maybe one of the major problems that we've got in the West, is judging people only on this. And so superficial. It, it's worse than superficial. It's artificial. And they joke about it. Like it's a, a funny subject. But at the same time, they get real serious if a woman chooses to cover herself up. Now, at the same time, there are legitimate complaints against what some Muslim men do. There's no doubt about that. If a man is beating up his wife or family, obviously that's not in Islam to start with. But it shouldn't have been associated with religion, but rather the lack of it or in opposition to it in reality. So from our point of view as Muslims, we're seeing something today that we have a difficulty in relating back to the time of our Prophet wasallam. Almost, well in fact anything and everything you want to know about how to live as a human being is covered by Islam in the Quran, the Hadith, the teachings, the things that our scholars have shown us how to use what's been sent down from Almighty Allah, how you can recognize how to use that to live as a better contributing citizen in your community. We know that. Alhamdulillah, that we have it. And in some places I visit, you actually see people putting it together and doing something with it, moving forward, progressing, using what they call modernity. I don't know if that's a real word or not, but they use it. And in any case, we see this in some places and Muslims following Islam right alongside of it. The problem is the way the West has distorted this picture to the extent that words like Sharia, Islam, and Muslim bring bad vibes even before we get into the subject. You can't even get into the subject without somebody being upset already. At the time of our Prophet wasallam. There were those who very much denied the message with which it came. There's no doubt about that. As a matter of fact, you'll probably remember this better than I will, because I'm reading a lot of this stuff in English. But I think it was right after the message comes to the Prophet ﷺ that he calls all the tribes out. You know, when he stands on the little knoll or the little small hill, whatever, and he starts calling, Yeah, Benny, so-and-so. Yeah, Benny Fulan, come on guys! And all the tribes are coming out, okay, what's going on, what's going on? Because the way he was doing it is the exact same way 
that when there's an emergency, you know, a big emergency, maybe somebody's coming to attack you, right? So they were out there, ready, what's, what's, what's going on? And who's calling us? Oh, it's Muhammad. And look at the title they gave him. Asadiq, he's the truthful one. We can trust anything he says. He's the trustworthy one. Okay, so if he's saying something, it's got to be big. Let's get over there. Oh, and when they get there, what happened? He said, have I told you behind me? Is a tribe that's coming to fight us. You know, an army is over here and they're coming at us. Would you believe me? They said, yeah, you never lied ever. <laughs> go get the sword, son. <laughs> We're ready to go. <laughs> he said, then I bear witness to you that there's only one deity, one God worthy of any worship. And I'm his messenger to you. And right away, they understood exactly what he said. He was telling them, you have to give up this filthy habit of worshiping these statues and idols. Give up these false notions, you know, the things that people worship other than Allah. In other words, we have a bumper sticker that says it. Worship the creator, not his creations. And they rejected it. For the most part, almost everybody there rejected the message on the spot. Some of, and they're his own relatives, some of his own uncles turned against him and even cursed him for bringing this message the way that he did. They didn't like that because he hit home. And some of the things that they did to follow up on that story a little bit, you know that they posted people at the entrances to the valley where they lived, just in case these folks would be coming from out of town to come to worship there. This is a center of worship in those days. Still is today for us, isn't it? And these people would be coming, and when they come through those passages in the mountains, they'd find somebody there telling them, warn them, be careful. When you get there, be careful of this guy, Muhammad. He's a magician, or he's a, a you know, a soothsayer. Maybe he's going to work on your brain. He's going to implant notions in your mind. Be careful, be careful. Warning against him, yeah? Magician, poet, different names that they tried to attribute to him. But above all, they wanted people to disbelieve in his message. But what hit me a few weeks ago when I was thinking about this, of all the things that they did and said to him for that first 10 years, you remember how hard those first 10, 12 years were really tough on him. Of all the things that they said and did, I don't recall them ever being called terrorists. You know why? Because they were the brunt of the attacks. They were the ones who were being put upon. They were the ones who were being attacked by everybody else. So it'd be kind of hard to label these guys as terrorists after you kick them and leave them in the dirt, you know. But this is the label that we've got today around the world. And the Sharia, that word, ooh. At the same time, in Tennessee, when they're trying to pass the law, by the way, they didn't get it through. They had to change the wording. Instead of saying Sharia, they changed the word to terrorism. As though those were interchangeable words. At the same time that was going on, did you know there was a group in Australia a group of Muslims trying to pass something there about Muslims should follow a kind of Sharia that's more modern or modified to suit the rulers of the time in their area. What does that mean? What you and I face as Muslims is a lack of proper knowledge and then that which is being put out, being very twisted. And oftentimes things that are being represented as Islam is, that has nothing to do with Islam or opposes Islam. So what we can do about this? Because the, I learned a long time ago in business, you never present a problem unless you're prepared to offer a solution for it. Because otherwise there's no benefit in your talk. You either come up with something to solve it before you open your mouth or keep your mouth closed. It's not exactly like the Hadith, but there is a Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, Man kana yamal akhar yakhulu khayr, aw yasmud. 
Let the one that believes in Allah on the last day either say good or be quiet. Keep silent. And that's a, a good habit that I want to encourage myself to practice as well. And what we're saying here is that there is a problem, but immediately there is a solution. If we recognize the problem, then it should be that the problem will help us solve it. What do we recognize? Well, first of all, we recognize that we're Muslims and we're scattered all over the world. We're not just here in Dubai. We're not just here in the Arabian Peninsula. We're not just in Turkey and Pakistan. But in fact, Muslims are all over the entire world. For the past few years, we have traveled, I'm talking about myself and the brothers working with me on the Guide Us TV project. We have traveled all the way from the northernmost part of the world, Trump's in Norway, the most northern masjid in the world, to the most southern masjid in the world. We visited to New Zealand and Australia and to uh, what's uh, South Africa. And these masjid and everything in between have the same common thing. You know what it is? It's the worship of one God, asking him to give us the guidance. It sounds pretty simple. The complication always comes in is how people interpret that. And those who have the least amount of knowledge oftentimes want to make the most noise about it. This is why it's critical for us, all of us, to take the responsibility to have facilities that provide the correct knowledge to people who we feel can really assimilate it and get it out to the other people. In other words, no more homegrown imams, guys that just jump up one day and, hey, I had a revelation. I, was, I saw that in Christianity a lot. Guys make up their own religions and go out, break off from the mainstream, and suddenly they feel like they're going to give you a new message. Like the guy who just told us the end of the world was going to be last week. <laughs> Even saying that's funny, the end of the world was last week. Well, then where are we at right now? <laughs> make you wonder, doesn't it? And what's really sad about it is, according to the monotheistic religions, we're talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all of us agree, that in, if we follow our book anyway, that for sure there will be a day of reckoning. There is going to be a last day. But in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of wars and rumors of wars. There are going to be a lot of liars out there, a lot of false prophets making a lot of weird predictions. And this is what we keep seeing again and again. So that when the real Jesus is here, peace be upon him, then very few people are going to be able to recognize this from all the lies and all the twisted thinking. And our sincerest desire is to join with Jews, Christians, and Muslims on the day that Jesus comes and be real believers. We hope Allah will guide all of us. This is, this is a beautiful message. But when is it going to get out to the West? Alhamdulillah, you know how happy it makes me feel to be here. To be able to say these things and know it's getting out here. We just wish it would like trickle over. And this is why we opened the television channel. Now on the first day of this year, January 1st, Allah blessed us with our own Satellite. We are now broadcasting 24 hours a day the message of Dahilalallah with some very good teachers and preachers and presenters of Islam. I didn't do anything. Allah did it. So we'll say Allah Akbar. He did it. I prayed for it. <laughs> That's about really all I can claim. And a lot of brothers and sisters sacrificed to make it happen. But look how much more blessing came. Without me doing anything, I didn't do it. They sent it to me in a statement from the other oh, broadcasters that we were picked up by two other satellites and now we're on three satellites and we're not even six months old. That is something to be happy about. So instead of just 50, 60,000, now over 200,000, yeah, 200,000 homes are watching the channel right now while I'm sitting here. Imagine that. And we didn't do anything extra except more dua. 
One of the things that we did when we started it was we said we have to focus on what real Islam is in the English language. So our motto is presenting true Islam in simple English. Making sure our presenters are able to discuss in English as simple as they would in any other language. Being sure that they had a good foundation and well grounded in what the real basics of Islam teach, not in things that they may have been picked up by traditions or cultures in other countries and so on. Of course, that narrowed the number of people that you could talk to, you know what I'm saying, really quick. But some of you have probably seen it. We have speakers who have been with us for a while and some new ones that were training at the same time. But we realized something else. We realized that if we charge money to subscribe to it, the only people who are gonna watch are the ones who already believe it. Make sense? I mean, you know, why would somebody who hates Islam, scared of Islam, afraid of Islam, want to even pay $15 a month to subscribe to a channel, an extra channel, you know, that they're getting on the cable or the dish? Why would they want to pay any extra money? <clears throat> I'll give you extra money if you get them to leave. So, we said, no, we're not going to charge any subscription. Okay. Now, right away, uh, the broadcasters, the, I'm talking about the uh, satellite owners, are saying, so uh, how are you going to pay us? What kind of commercials are you going to be running on there? And how often, how many minutes of commercials are you going to run every 59 minutes and 59 seconds? Because that's how they balance it out. And when I said, no, I don't want any commercials. Why? Well. Commercials could compromise the message. Think about it. Somebody comes to you and says, look here, uh, our company, we distribute, let's say, meat huh, all across the United States. And we don't want you talking about uh, what's halal and haram in the meat business. Huh? Just leave it alone. Oops, now what? And any speaker you get on there, you edit out, if he brings up the subject of the biha, Cut this guy out. Then what would you do? Even if I hold an opposing view, we can't even open the discussion. Because you lose a major sponsor. Somebody that's advertising, maybe doing four or $500,000 a month in advertising, and you're going to just tell him, hey, take a walk? Uh-oh. And what about some of the other areas? Clothing, for instance. That could be a big problem. Makeup. Well, we just talked about what the cosmetic industry has done to the ladies. And then on top of that, consider one of the biggest subjects of all, and you guys are familiar with it here, finance. Huh? What's the subject of finance in Islam? Come on, guys. Mm -mm. So for us, we said, I want other channels, by the way. I want Muslim channels all over America, I do. And if they want to take advertising subscriptions, I hope they do. Because they have to have funding to keep going. But for us, for us, the new Muslims who've come to Islam and realize the importance of the pure message of Islam has to get to the people. For us, no subscriptions, no advertising. So that's what we came up with so far. It's not easy. Because the third option, and this is an option they sent us from the satellite company when we started. Number one, subscriptions. Number two, advertisers. Number three, and it was <coughs> a very sarcastic, deep pockets. That's what it said. And I felt like, well, maybe we don't have deep pockets, but we have a lot of pockets. And we began talking to so many of the brothers and sisters across America. United States and Canada, and do you know what? Within one year, from the little $20, $30 donations, one little boy donates a dollar every month. Yeah, but from that, we were able to get started, believe it or not. And you might think, well, I didn't think Muslims would really follow through. Neither did I, especially because I tried for six years before that and didn't see anything. 
It wasn't until we went to the Hadith of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Keep in mind, I told you when I started that every single thing that you want to find an answer to is in Islam. The problem is we don't look enough. That's the problem. But there's a Hadith, the Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The meaning of it in English when he said that Allah, Almighty God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, he loves the thing so much charity and good deeds. He loves the thing which is done regularly. Even if it's small. More than the thing which is big, but it's only done once. And I said, let me try that. I've tried everything else. And so we started talking about this hadith and pushing it and asking the brothers, whatever you do, just be sure you do it regularly because Allah will bless us. And they did. And Allah did. And we got to channel. So my message really for you today is if you want to solve this problem of the chaos that we see around us every day, go back to your Lord. Go back to the one that created you in the first place. And start like I did 20 years ago when I put my head on the ground and said those magic words. Guide me. And we say it every day in our salat, don't we? Ihdina. Ihdina suratul mustaqim. Guide us. Guide us. Guide us. And by the way, that's why we named it Guide Us TV. Some people said we called it Guide US TV. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Me again. <laughs> All right. Sheikh Yusuf. Audience. He's kind of cute, isn't he? <laughs> but you're cuter. <laughs> so again, back to the um, <coughs> format. There's three mics. One from the right, center, left. Now, it's a requirement. Are we going to do question and answers? Huh? Are, yes. Okay, can they just like give me the answers and I'll guess what the question was? <laughs> no, they do it on Jeopardy, you win trips and stuff like that. No? Okay, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. Please, uh, brothers and sisters, respected guests, turn off your cell phones. I think we mentioned that. Just can I leave mine on in case I want to do like a shout out or something? <laughs> Hello, mom. Yeah, like that. Definitely. You're the boss. I was also wondering something else, too, if you guys don't mind, because this is going to be on television come Sunday. How many of you knew that? This is going to be on TV. So uh, if you don't mind, please make the questions real easy. <laughs> and if I look like I'm getting stuck, you know, just kind of like help me along. All right, yeah, so to turn off your cell phones, basic. Keep questions on topic. No hard questions. Easy questions. Well, while you guys are getting your ideas together, can I tell you what one of the most common questions is? Most people will ask me, how did you get to Islam? And some will be even more pointed than that. When I come up against a real hard shell Bible thumping Christian, he'll say, why did you turn your back on Jesus? You know, well, to put your mind at ease, folks, number one, I don't think I turned my back on anything. I tried to look even more forward. The review that I did of my Bible encouraged me more and more and more to look at this subject of what Islam was teaching because I wanted to disprove Islam. And certainly I felt like I'd be able to find more mistakes in the Quran than I ever found in my Bible. But actually the opposite was true. What I found in the Bible that matched up perfectly with what is being taught in the Quran, that Jesus never claimed to be a God. In fact, what I saw, a clear claim that he said he was a servant of God. The word servant is in my translation of the Bible, that he is God's servant. Or in Arabic, abd, abd. 
Well, I could ask the Muslims here, how many Muslims here, number one, you believe in the God of Adam and Abraham? Raise your hand. Well, okay, that looks pretty much like all of us. And if we carry it a little bit further, and also believe in the God of Moses and the Ten Commandments, or all the commandments that came with Moses. Again, there we go. Hope this guy's catching all that up there on this. <laughs> we call that the crane, right? They call this the, the crane. crane. And we don't have one. I just take a real long tripod and swing it around in my hand, make it look like it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, how about if I said, how many here actually believe in the miracle birth that Miriam, Mary had, and when she had a baby, she's not having any husband and no man touches her, miracle birth of Jesus, and believe that Jesus is the Kalamata law, the word of Allah, he's the Messiah, or Messiah, and that he's going to be back in the last days. Raise your hand. Whoa, okay. And that's what most Christians don't know. They don't know that. Now, all you need to do, is, uh, don't forget, you, nobody's going to hear you but me, so you need to go to the microphone. If you have an elbow, you have a brother has a question. Go ahead, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu My name is Cassiano. I am converted uh, four years ago to Islam. May Allah accept from you, Amin. Inshallah, alhamdulillah. Jakalak hair. My, my question is, uh, is about the chaos today. Because about we, the, the chaos, 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 the chaos, chaotic, yeah. chaotic word, yeah. is uh, we know in the uh, apocalypse and in the Bible and in the Quran have many, many topics talking about the end of the world and everything. So it is, uh, we, f we feel, honestly, we feel it started. It started, it's already happening. So it's natural, it's normal. What is happening now in the world is normal. It's something like was, uh, we are waiting for this. So we know something will really bad will happen. Claro. So everything what's happening, what's happening in Pakistan and everywhere, is no, it's normal. It's something natural. That's my question. Is if it's, claro. it's something completely natural, you need to just accept. Verdad. It's claro. Uh, it, it's clear. Yeah. Ablas. Okay. <laughs> See? Thank you so much. Zakalak. Um, I was just saying in Spanish, it's clear what his question is. I want to ask you, uh, how many of you knew that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was questioned in a similar manner when the angel Jibril or Gabriel came to him? One of the questions he asked, when is the hour, translating to common English today, when's the last day? When's it all going to be over with? When is the hour? How many of you heard about that question? Heard about it? Yeah. And what was the answer? Did he say it's going to be on the 21st of May 2000? <laughs> no, that was somebody else, wasn't it? No, actually, he said the one being asked doesn't know any more than the one asking. Meaning you don't know and I don't know. But the signs. And this is one of the most famous of all of the hadith or sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's called the Hadith of Jibril. And here is something amazing, these two signs. The first sign is talking about when a woman is giving birth to her own master. Now when in the world could you imagine it could happen that children are treating their own parents like slaves. Yet, I was just in New York a few weeks ago at our new studios there, and I was amazed at the way the youth treat their parents. And then it hit me, that describes exactly. Today, even when a child is in elementary, the primary school, they're already talking back to their parents, telling them things like, shut up, to their parents. What are you going to do about it? You can't make me. This attitude. And then as they get older as teens, get out of my face. And disappear. Don't come back for a couple days. And when they do come back, bad attitude. And then when they're maybe at the age of college or something like that, 
And I heard one say, I'm 18 years old now. I've had it with you. I've put up with you all my life. <laughs> this is a child talking to the mother? I've had it with you? Who carried the child inside of her? Who's the one that gave birth in pain after pain after pain? Who's the one that nursed that child from her own breast? Who's the one that taught the child to walk and talk? To have what, even what we call the mother tongue coming from the mother teaching the child how to speak. And let's don't even get into the changing the diapers and staying up all night long. By the way, that's women's work, right? Not according to Islam, no. Look at this. And then, when the parents get old, who says, oh, and I've seen it happen in our own family. Who is the one that says, oh, I want the parents to come stay with me. I want the reward. I want the reward from the Lord. I want that. No. No, 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 no. The question becomes, who's going to help divvy up the payment so we can put them in the old folks' home? You've got to pay your share. No, I don't want to. I put up with them all those years. I don't need them. And then when they die, the immediate thing, actually just before they die, when the doctor comes to me, I heard the doctor say this to some people. That your father has now reached a level, uh, his quality of life is just not there. He doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know what he's doing. So if he should need life support, do you want us to give it to him or just let it go? <gasps> and if they said, yeah, just let it go. We don't want to waste the money, you know. What is that? And then when he dies, are they rushing in to take care of the body and be sure it's buried properly? Or they can't wait to read the will and immediately contest it because they didn't feel like they got enough? Yeah, I saw it. To a very sweet old lady, so sweet. She used to cook for them. Even when she was old, by, living as a widow by herself, they would go over to her house on Sunday, let her do all the cooking and washing and cleaning, and then disregard her until Mother's Day. And then they would bring some roses, some chocolate candy, and that was it. That sounds like slavery to me. What do you think? But this is the one that really got me. The second sign that the Prophet ﷺ talked about. When he said... When the poor Arab living in the desert, you know, we call them Bedouin, when they are competing with each other to build tall buildings in the desert. And I heard that that's happening somewhere. <laughs> I don't have solid evidence, but I've heard it. Amazing? He predicted it. When I was in Saudi a couple years ago, I was standing right by a building. It had the name of one family on it. And they were telling me, you know, it's, everything's for lease. It's empty. It was a real tall building. And there was another building going across the street. They were constructing it with all the cranes and everything going. had the name of another family on it. And it happened this one was related to the family or something, and I, and I said, uh, this building's empty. Yeah, I can't find anybody to put in it. So why are you building this one? I said, so it'll be taller. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. <laughs> so you'll have a taller empty building than they have. <laughs> and these are signs of the last days, and we're sitting here laughing. What's really interesting is some of the other hadiths. Sheikh McCarthy with us right now, he probably knows a lot more about it than I do. But for sure, some of the other hadiths that I've read about the last days and the signs are even as amazing. Like when you will be talking to, trying to communicate with the animals of the sea. And you watch him talking to the dolphins. Have you seen those programs? And they're hooking up with the beep, 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 beep. 
da 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 What did he say? Oh, talk to the dolphin. These are the same people that won't talk to their mother on Mother's Day. Talk to a fish. <laughs> and in the same hadith, it mentions that your extremities would talk to you. You're like you hold something in your hand, you're talking to. Hold on, let me take this call and I'll be right back. What did you say? And then it says, and your side will inform you of what's happening in your house even though you're away. You know those pages that tell you what's going on? Don't forget to bring home a loaf of bread or, yeah. This is 1400 years ago before they even had electricity. Huh? So many predictions. And we're not talking about looking for it in the future. We're talking about in the past tense. How many years ago did those come? So how close is this last day? That was an excellent question, but the one being asked doesn't know any more than the one who was asking. <laughs> Do we have another question? We'll take a question from the middle, from the sisters right now. Oh, there's sisters up here. Okay. Yes. Um, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. They got a lot of lights in my eyes. I can't see them there. Just, just before um, you start, sister. Sorry. I've, I've just got a quick question about the, um, the, the sign that you mentioned. And I've seen it in the Quran, um, in the translation, sorry, the, um, the extra bit. Um, what I saw was in the English um, translation, so I'm not sure the exact words that the Prophet used. Um, so what, what I read was the, the shepherd, shepherds of the um, red, red camels who will compete against um, building to, the tallest buildings to that effect. So um, I was having this conversation. Probably the with, same one. Somebody chose different words to say the same thing. Okay. So the conversation that I had with someone was um, basically said, um, it didn't say Arabs. What do they mean by shepherds of red camels, it doesn't say the word Arabs. And the, the claim was that we twist the words to suit our needs. Um, it didn't say Arabs, but we'll, we'll make it sound like it said something that's applicable today. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Yeah, it'd be a good idea to, do, do you know the Arabic language system? No, I don't. Okay, first thing you want to do, I've got a, uh, I have a website for all of you who'd like to know the Arabic language. It's called ArabicInEnglish.com. It, you can go there and, and check it out and see how we begin right from the very beginning showing you how to use the English language to learn the Arabic. You don't have to know Arabic to learn Arabic. You can just start out right away. That's number one. Uh, the second thing is that you are right in what you said that people will interpret something. And the word Bedouin, it very clearly defines the people of the desert. This is not used anywhere else. And when the word Arab is used, it's clear that you mean Arab. So all you have to do is just take the hadith and just read it in the Arabic and you'll hear the words for yourself. I think that's the best way to answer your question. Right, thank you. Okay, thank you, sister. Take a question from the left side. Brother, please. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh uh, Yusuf. My name is Faisal. I'm from Malaysia. Uh, first of all, I would like to send uh, the greetings and regards from my children. They're a big fan of yours. <laughs> Unfortunately, they cannot come today. Uh, but anyway, um, the... Uh, we always uh, watch your programs on YouTube and on the internet for quite frequently. And uh, the uh, question that my children or my wife keep on asking me, I mean, why, uh, what makes you choose Islam? I mean, what attracts you to Islam to begin with? I mean, it's for probably a long time ago, yeah? Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Faisal. We appreciate that very much. And tell everybody back in Malaysia, big salam from us and... Uh, I was in Malaysia only once, and while I was there, I had some of the best treatment you could ever, ever even imagine. It was really great. And, and my daughter was with me over there, too. We had, this, we had a great time. We, we did. Alhamdulillah. And I like the way, too, that they, again, this is a Muslim country that's not so closed-minded, you know, to shut down everything, just give everybody a chance. Because while we were there, we found that the Muslims and Christians living beside each other in a very nice way. Uh, that, was, that was appreciated. And uh, even some commercial things that we, we found from back home while we were in Malaysia. I got to eat at Bubba Gump shrimp and more. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But uh, 
the question about me coming to Islam really isn't the topic today. So if I could, I'd just like to refer to it briefly and tell you where you can get the whole story, if that's okay. Because it takes approximately 47 minutes if I leave out some of the best jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that if I had to narrow it down to one thing, what was the most influential thing to me would be proof. Because the question comes like this to me, what do you have in your religion that I don't have? Because if your religion is better than mine, I will leave mine and go to yours. That's what I was told by the Muslim I was trying to convert. I was trying to convert a Muslim to go to Christianity. Now, when he said that, I said, got him. This guy's on the hook. Reel him in. Because, number one, you don't have to pray five times a day to be a Christian. <laughs> number two, you don't have to fast the whole month. In fact, you don't have to fast at all. Three, you don't have to pay zakah. What's that? And you don't have to make a pilgrimage anywhere to be a Christian. It's just what you believe. That's it. That's it. <sighs> and then he finished the sentence. He said, I'll go to your religion, if it's better than my religion, but you need proof. I'm like, uh, proof? No, no. Religion's about faith, brother. It's not about proof. Faith. He said, in Islam, we have faith, but we have proof. Without thinking of what I was saying, I looked at him right now and I said, you mean to sit there and tell me as a Muslim, you can prove there's God? He said, do you mean to sit there and tell me as a preacher for Christianity that you can't? <laughs> now, there are Christian scientists that offer very good evidences. I just wasn't one of them. So don't get the idea that there's no proof in monotheism, because there it definitely is. But it was something that really woke me up. The proofs that you find in the Old Testament, New Testament, that God exists are very much supported by and augmented by the Quran and what's been revealed with it as well. In fact, in the many years that I studied the two books side by side, almost two and a half years, I can honestly say that there's nothing in the Bible that contradicts the teachings of the Quran except where the Bible contradicts itself. And from that, from that, I was able to realize that now all I got to do is prove some mistakes in the Quran and I got it made. So I started reading it as I went through it. I kept seeing more and more things that I liked, but I kept pushing to find out something in here that's going to be contradictory. It has to be. There has to be. This is a man-made book. That was my mind anyway at the time. So this is going to be a mistake. Couldn't find it. Went all the way through back to about the 20, I'm going to guess it was about the 26th, 27th juice of the Quran. And when I got back there, I realized, hey, this is not going like I thought it would. And then I came across the verse that said, and then it hit me. I said, well, what, then what else in the world would you say about the monotheistic faith if it isn't that statement? And Allah said, the, the meaning in English, that he did not create the jinn in mankind except for worship. The worship of one God without any partners. No images, no statues, no... Uh, vainglorious statements, just believe in God and obey His commandments. What was the biggest problem that I faced was myself. I never wanted to admit I was wrong. It was a problem that I had when I was in business. I didn't like to admit that. It was a problem I had in my family life. I didn't like to admit when I was wrong. That's a hard thing for some people to say, I was wrong, I made a mistake. But that was a, a real turning point in my life because if I didn't do it, I realized then I'm gonna continue in the same mess. So that was the hardest thing. But once I put my head on the ground, 
in the same direction I'd been watching this Muslim pray for three months. And I really opened my mind and my heart and I just said it like this, God, guide me. And when I raised up my head, I knew it. There really is God. And it's not about outside effects. It's about the inside. And it might even answer our question for today about the chaos. Because we look around us and, oh, look at that problem over there, this problem over there, when's the end of the world? Oh, who's burning the Quran? Somebody did this over there. Why? Uh, but we don't want to look inside and see where we're wrong. We don't want to really admit to our mistakes. We don't really want to deal with the fact I'm wrong. Because when a person says the Shahada, they are negating any other form of worship, devotion, commitment of the heart, because you're giving it all to the Lord above. Because when somebody says that with sincerity, this is the big thing. This is the really big thing. Maybe you don't see it move mountains and shake the earth and cause tidal waves and tsunamis. But that's really what's happening. Ash hadu. An la ilaha. Illallah. I bear witness here and now, right here in Dubai, that there is nothing worthy of my worship except one God without any partners. And that Muhammad is his last and his final servant, slave, and messenger. Allahu Akbar. We'll take a question from the sister side, but just before you start, just like to know how many non-Muslim guests do we have? If you could just please put your hands up. Don't be scared. Sheikh Yusuf this doesn't bite. Okay. I would encourage our guests to you know, come forward and ask some questions if you feel comfortable. Yeah, if we have any of our guests with us today, and first of all, we welcome you very much. And we appreciate your courage to come out here with all these terrorists. They're Muslims. <laughs> that bomb class is tomorrow night, right? You, you know what? They, they say you can only see it once. <laughs> but seriously, uh, we would really like to have your questions because this gives us an opportunity to see where you're coming from and it gives you a chance to explore and find out what some of the answers are to the concerns. Usually, the questions that I get most from the universities where I visit I deal with the subject of the treatment of people. What is the treatment of non-Muslims? What's the treatment of women? What is the treatment uh, of subjects like in war and things like that? So if you don't mind, I'd like to answer the question you didn't ask, but I'll throw it out there for you. And that is, what does Islam say about the way we treat others? Well, first of all, God Almighty makes it very, very clear with a word in the Arabiya. It's zulm. Zulm. Allah says he never does zulm. God never does zulm. And he forbids us to do it. And that's uh, usually translated to English as aggressive or transgressive oppression. And certainly terrorism is one of those that fits under that category. So we are commanded in the Quran to fight against any form of munkar. And munkar is, again, a, a large umbrella underneath which you will also find acts of aggression and terrorism. We find in the Quran clearly an order for the Muslims to aggressively go out and fight against acts that you would describe as terrorism, which under another general uh, term are used in Arabic, fitna. And fight against fitna until Allah's deen can, I think we're translated as, um, can be openly displayed. It's very clear. And if you understand that, you can see that 
the only time that Muslims are allowed to engage in active combat is in the support of what Islam teaches and to prevent that teaching from being destroyed. But never as the aggressor to go in and take away other people's rights because that would be an exact contradiction to the meaning. You cannot violate people's rights. Human rights in Islam is one of the big attractions that I've found after I got into Islam. And it still interests me very much 20 years later to see so many of the things that we have today that we're so proud of in the West. But Islam came with that long ago. Long before the Geneva Convention. <laughs> Actually, long before there was a place called Geneva. Islam is coming with some very beautiful teachings. For instance, how do you treat your enemies? Now, in a sense, we find that in the New Testament that you should be, you know, even kind to your enemies. But not in the sense that Islam clearly spells it out. When you've captured people that were trying to kill you, you captured them. You got them right now. You cannot abuse them. You can't chop off their body parts. Can't kill them. Can't stand them up on a box with a hood over their head and two wires hooked to their fingers. And I didn't mean anything by that. <laughs> or did I? <laughs> so the things that we see being violated today by some countries against the Geneva Convention long ago were forbidden for Muslims to do. Look at this. In general. Leave the enemy subject alone for a minute. Just talk about in general. Your neighbor. Our prophet, peace be upon him, said he's not a believer who fills his stomach up and goes to sleep at night well, his neighbor's stomach remains empty. And that's kind of scary when you consider how much food we eat every day. That's kind of scary when you consider that how many neighbors we have. So the companions and followers of Muhammad, they ask him, well, who is my neighbor? He said, 40 in any direction. For sure, that's one of the sunnas or the ways of Muhammad that most of us have left off. We really have. We don't really concern ourselves about our neighbors like we used to. And I hope that we'll come back to that. I mean, another thing about the treatment of people in Islam is the responsibility that we have to share this message with them. Not to proselytize. No. Not to convert. No. But to share the information in a way they can understand it and make it easy for them to know, understand, and if they like, to accept this message of believing in one God and doing what he wants you to do. And of course, that's the area that I try to work in every day. But again, this is something that we've forgotten about. We say, okay, hey, I'm a Muslim, uh, you're a Hindu, or you're a whatever. And that wasn't how that was intended at all. That verse that says to you your way and me my way was when people are coming to make fun of you, to attack you, to basically hurt your feelings. Okay, you deliver a message. And if they don't like it, okay, then, then it's when you tell them, you worship what you worship, I'll worship what I worship, you know? And if you, you don't want what we got, okay, we don't want that either, so have a nice day. Go worship your toys or whatever you want to do. The treatment, now, in, I want to get more specific, the treatment of your relatives. How important is it for a man to treat his wife in a good way? And again, if you said, well, I know Muslims that don't treat their wives very good, well, <laughs> for sure he's going, to get, he's going to be charged for that on the Day of Judgment, without a doubt. But the lady in Islam is clearly giving some very big rights 
that they never had before the Quran was revealed. Because the verse starts out with the word Rajul. Rajul is male. Males. This is in chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran on Nisa. And here's where Allah said the males have the responsibility over the females. And he said it like this, because Allah, he gave the one power that he didn't give to the other one. So you got the power, you got the muscle, get out there and get it to work. And bring it home. And how many of us forget this? In Islam, the man is responsible for the house. Who makes the house? Payments? If you're renting a house or who has to buy the house? Who? The man. Utilities. Hmm? Food. Clothing. Medical. Education. Who's responsible to take care of the lady and make sure she has all these things? This is in the Quran. Who? Males. So how much, suppose the lady has some wealth, maybe she inherited it, maybe she has a career, whatever. What percentage should she pay? And this was asked to me by a dear friend of mine one time. What percentage should my wife be paying out of her salary for our place where we live? When I said zero, he looked at me like, huh? You know, she quit her job just right after that. <laughs> True story. But that's the beautiful thing that a lot of women, they don't realize. Islam has given her the thing she'd always wanted. You know. What's mine is mine. <laughs> and what's yours is mine too. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the treatment of the parents? We spoke about that a, a minute ago. About children enslaving their parents. Look at this one. Now keep in mind, at the time this came, in the Arab desert, a woman was like the lowest scum that there was to these men. They treated them terrible. There was no limit on how many wives a guy could have. There was no limit on the way that he could treat her either. He could beat them up, he could kick them around, nobody said anything. And the worst of all, many of them would take a newborn daughter to the desert and bury her alive in the burning sand. And consider that macho. One of the very first things that Islam was dealing with after the correct belief was to stop this practice of mistreating women. And when we talk about rights, I want to wrap this answer up with this statement from the Prophet, peace be upon him. When we talk about rights, a man came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and said, after Allah's rights, I mean, you know, Allah has the right to be worshipped alone, without partners. And the Prophet has the right to be followed, as opposed to following Obama or somebody else. Follow your Prophet. So after Allah and his messenger, who has the first rights on me? The most rights on me? What did he say? Ladies? I knew the ladies knew this one. Nice and loud. Remember, you don't have microphones. You're on TV. Let's see it again. After Allah and his messenger, who has the most rights on me? Mother. Your mother. And then who? Mother. Your mother. And then who? Mother. Your mother. And then? Father. Maybe your father. No, it is his father. <laughs> <laughs> so this was something really strange. This saying coming from him was like, huh? What? Women have rights? My mother, my mother, my mother, why is this emphasis coming like this? And sure enough, the women were finally freed from a very oppressive regime. I wanted to use that word in a sentence tonight. Nothing to do with the recent events in Egypt or something like that. So I think that uh, that's a very good question and certainly something that I encourage all non-Muslims who you don't know a lot about Islam look for what is human rights in Islam. And if you start reading where people are chopping off hands and fingers and heads and necks and all the rest of it, uh, check another website. Maybe, just maybe, there's a little uh, something askew on that answer. Thank you for the question. On the sister side, we have a... Salam alaikum. Sorry. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Go ahead, sister. We have a sister over here who would like to take her shahada. Masha'Allah. 
Now we're cooking. For that, I'm going to get up. We have, uh, you said we have a lady that's ready to accept Islam. Yes. Yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, what's your name? My name is Vanessa. Vanessa. Yes. Okay, has anybody explained to you that the most important thing in Islam is we believe there's only one God and he has no partners. Did you understand that? Yeah, many people, uh, many sisters told me about that. Okay, and we believe that Muhammad is the last messenger, but we also believe in all the other messengers as well. Did they explain that? Yeah, they did. Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, and for sure Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they explained all of that. They are just messing, I mean, um, uh, prophets. As prophets, right. Yeah. This, is, this is very important, and we believe in them as prophets, not gods or sons of gods. Okay, so, and you're ready now to begin to live the life of a Muslim, trying your best to obey what Almighty Allah wants you to do? Yes, I'm totally ready. Totally ready, okay. <laughs> All right, then uh, you want to do it in English first, and then inshallah, God willing, we'll do it in the Arabic language. We're Texas Arabic, but it'll be close. <laughs> okay? Okay. Okay, just repeat after me. I swear. I swear. There's no God to worship. There's no God to worship. Except one God. Except one God. Allah. Allah. And I swear. And I swear. Muhammad is his messenger. Muhammad is his messenger. And now, inshallah, we'll do the Arabic. I'll go slow and just repeat what you hear. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa. Wa. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Mashallah. Mashallah. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> now. Thank you, brother. You did a good job on that, and we're real proud of you. I think I should mention to you, and I'm sure they'll tell you, but for the record, when anybody enters into Islam in sincerity, on that point and at that time, in that place, Allah removes every single sin that they ever committed. So this means you're just like when you came forth out of your mother. It means you have no sins at all. You're like newborn. And this was the expression used in the past by other prophets, explaining to people, when you accept this, you'll be like newborn. So you're newborn in Islam, this means you didn't convert, actually, you reverted, because this is the natural state of a child when they're born as well. Innocent, without sin, and certainly, inshallah, God willing, still lots of good deeds that you have, because Allah took away only the bad ones, and purified all your other deeds, your actions, and now you have all of that working for you. There's another bonus that goes with this, and that is that you now have direct connect. Direct connect, and you're not going to have to worry about running out of minutes or the battery going dead, because Allah is always ready to take your dua, your petition to Him, your prayers to Him. All you have to do is ask Him in, in your heart, and He's going to accept that. And on top of that, you have another thing that really helps charge your batteries up. He wants you to do this five times a day. And it's called in Arabic, Salah. And Salah related to another word in Arabic, which means connection. So this is, inshallah, your connection with God. You want to keep that up every day. They'll help you with that. Sisters will explain it to you. But there's another area that I need to warn you about. Because you just said, I believe. Allah tells us in chapter 29, verses 2 and 3 of the Quran, Surah Ankabut, do the people think they're going to be left alone just because they said, I believe? And they're not going to be put into a big calamity or fitna? Just as I put the people before them, uh, this is Allah talking, He's saying, just as the people before them were put into this 
big calamities. And so this is to show who are the real truthful and who are the liars. So even though you're going to be tested, even though you're going to experience some difficulty, I want you to remember this is just from Allah. And you need to be patient. And remember this. Verily after difficulty comes the ease. For sure, for sure, for sure. After any difficulty, Allah will bring ease. So be patient with the tests that Allah gives you. And finally, this one little piece of advice and kind of a notification, really. The biggest fitna or difficulty that most new Muslims receive is other Muslims. <laughs> so we're sorry about that in advance. But that's the reality. That's what you're up against. While we're on this subject of people accepting Islam, is there anybody else that feels like this is a good time for them to say Shahada? If we have somebody else that feels strong, you want to do that? Okay, if you'd like to go over to the microphone, go ahead. If anybody else would like to join him, do we have uh, some others, some sisters here, brothers over here, anybody else? How about this? Some of us, uh, we claim we're Muslim because we got the name Muhammad, Abdullah, but maybe, uh, you know what I'm saying, maybe the Salat been a little bit weak for the past 20 years. <laughs> and some things are kind of missing and you'd feel kind of good about uh, making your Shahada. I want you to think about that real serious while we help our brother here. Now tell us your name, brother. Um, my name is Angel. Angel? Yes, sir. Angel uh, from Philippines. I like that, actually. <laughs> you don't have any wings, do you? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's cool. Did anybody explain to you about our belief as Muslim? We believe there's really only one God. Yes. Of Adam. Yes. The God of Abraham, Moses, David, Suleiman, Jesus yes. Christ, peace be upon and also Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yes, sir. And also that we have, and I didn't mention that for the sister, but I'll mention it to you. We have six areas of things that we believe in. First of all, we believe in the law. And we believe in the angels. <laughs> and we believe in the books. All of the books came from Allah. We believe that, although we don't accept if they're translated, okay? So the original books that came from Allah. And we believe in all of these prophets who came as real prophets of God, and then we believe in the day of resurrection, that all people will be brought back on the day of judgment. Along with that, we also believe in the cutter or predestination, that everything is under Allah's control. He never loses control. It's always there. He's got this control yes. over everything. So have they explained that to you? Yes, sir. And you're ready to accept that? Yes, I accept it already before. Okay. Now, is the gentleman right behind you there, is he ready to accept it? Tell us your name. He's uh, my brother. Huh? My brother. Your brother, what's his name? Bas. Bas. Bas? Bas? Yep. Bas. 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 B-A-S? Yes. B. B-A-S. We Arabs can't say that letter. B-A-S. <laughs> Beast be upon you. <laughs> Pass. Yeah. Peace in angel. Uh, your parents had something in mind for you from the beginning, guys. You're in good shape. <laughs> Peace in angel. MashaAllah. Okay. Are we ready? Yes, we're ready. English first. I swear, both of you at the same time. I swear. I swear. I swear. There's no God to worship. There's, There's no, no God, God to worship. worship. Except one God. Except, Except one God. Allah. 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 And I swear. And I, I swear. swear. Muhammad is his messenger. Muhammad, Muhammad is his messenger. Ashhadu. 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 An la ilaha. An la ilaha. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. An Muhammad. An Muhammad. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. By the way, when this is all over with, guys,
Keep your eye on these fellas here because you're going to want to do a lot of hugging. You know what I'm saying? Uh, no, brothers, not the girls. <laughs> Come on. Huh? Where you get these guys? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Do I have anybody else who is accepting this notion that we just were talking about, that there really is one God and we need to do what he wants us to do on his terms according to the way we learned it from Muhammad. Anybody else like to do that now? You remember what I said, the hardest thing for me to do was to admit I was wrong. Don't let that be the thing that stops you from getting to paradise. If you feel like you need to do your shahada, don't let this intimidate you. Do it. Nobody knows if they'll even wake up in the morning. So that's, that's really an important consideration. Keep that in mind. Okay, do we have any other questions? We do. We have one. Yes. Mr. Question? Yeah, there is another question from the sister side. I'm just uh, telling it on behalf of the sister. Um, she's, a, she's a French lady. She's our sister in humanity. And she would like to ask, how do I believe in God? Uh, she was a Christian before, but um, she has been raised uh, by her parents as a Christian, but she's not a Christian since the last five years, according to her. And uh, she would like to know, how can she again believe in God? I want to tell you what happened to me and see if this makes sense to you. Even though I was exploring two religions at the same time, the one I grew up with, with Christianity and Islam, there were also other things running through my mind that I'd encountered, books, people that I met, ideas and concepts from professors down the line. And all of that was going through my mind pretty much at the same time. And I was sharing this with the Muslim who I was trying to convert. I had just witnessed what you just witnessed tonight. I had just witnessed a Catholic priest accepting Islam and was shocked. How could this man who devoted his whole life, his career, everything he knows, everything he is all about, he just gave it up to go to Islam. And I had just had a dialogue with my wife about that subject and discovered she also was interested to be a Muslim. And I still had trouble saying it. I had trouble. To the extent that while I was telling her, she said, I want to get a divorce. I said, what? She said, yeah, a Muslim can't be married to a Christian. I said, whoa, I didn't say I want to be one of them Muslim guys. Don't worry about it. Besides, he told us that a Muslim lady couldn't be married to a Christian man. She said, that's what I'm talking about. I want to be a Muslim. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, hold on. Okay, I'll be a Muslim too. She said, I don't believe you. Why? Well, you're lying. You're just saying it. Because a minute ago you said you wouldn't be one. Now you say you will. Either way, you're a liar. Then or now. Either way. Uh-uh. Then she told me, get out. I was halfway down the stairs when I realized, you know, I just got kicked out of my own father's house. <laughs> It hit me hard, and I went and woke up the Muslim. He stayed with us, you know. And I said, i got to talk to you. So we were talking, and your subject that you were asking about came up. After all of the rest of what we talked about, how do I know? And look what he told me. He said, this is not an issue, really, about you and the priest, or you and your wife, or you and your father, or you and me. This is an issue between you and your Lord. The one you need to be talking to is him. And he walked off and left me standing there. And that's when I decided, you know what? I'm going to do something really big here. I'm going to face myself in the same direction he did. Put my head on the ground the way I saw him do it. And then... 
figure out what to do next. And I'm with my head on the ground, and I guess by now you figured out I don't have trouble articulating ad infinitum. I have no problem talking, okay? But on that occasion, I couldn't say anything. Nothing. Because I was looking in my heart for what do I really want to say? What do I really, really want to say? And the only words that came out of my mouth were, Oh God, guide me. And if you do that, then from there on you'll be all right. Because if you're sincere, and if there's a God, who else is going to guide you? And that's what Islam teaches us. It's as simple as that. You know for a fact that you exist. How did you get here? You know for a fact there's a universe out there, and you know that it didn't come about all by itself. How did it all happen? And if you haven't had a chance yet to study this book in any language, it's now in French as far as I know, you can take a chance to look through the translations of the Quran. I think you'll find, if you're serious about it, I think you'll find the guidance there. Because there's a condition, actually a couple of conditions when you read it. It starts out with a seven verse prayer. But right after that, the biggest chapter of the Quran comes. And it says these words like this. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم ذلك كتاب الله ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليه وما أنزل من قبل this is the key. The mufta is right there. Because in the verses before, the seven verses I mentioned to you, it contains the statement that I said. Edina Suratu Muslim. Guide us. Guide us to the straight path. Anybody in this room right now, I challenge you. I challenge you to say that in your heart. Don't, don't even move your lips, but in your heart, if you have any doubt about who, there being a God or who God is, just say this in your heart. Oh God, guide us. Guide us. Edina Surat al-Mustaqim. And then it's up to him, isn't it? All up to him. The meaning of the verse that I read to you? It's an answer to your prayer. You just ask to be guided. It said, this, actually it says that, Dalek, that. That is the book wherein there is no doubt a guidance for those who have a taqwa. And they believe in al ghaib the unseen. They establish regular worship. And they give out of the provision that Allah gives them in charity to help the poor the impoverished. And they believe. They believe in the law. They believe in what's been sent down to you, meaning Muhammad Sallallahu And they believe in what was sent down before. And they believe in the day of judgment, the Akhra. And these are the people, these are the people who are really the successful. These are the people who are on the true guidance of Almighty God. So if you want to be guided, and you just ask to be guided, this is the way. The way, number one, and I left this in Arabic language for you. You better have taqwa, or else it won't work. What is taqwa? The translations usually say righteousness, piousness, good guy, you know, stuff like that. Well, the reality is that this word means a partition, a hijab, a barrier, a shield. Why would I need a shield? What's that for? It's a shield between you and something from Allah. And if you said, wait a minute, how could I protect myself against my creator? Well, you can't, but you can protect yourself from one of the things that's going to happen. And that's the evidence of his 
anger on the day of judgment. And that shield will protect you. And what is that shield? A taqwa. To have this God consciousness in all that you do. Try your best to live a good life according to what God says it is. Not according to what you think it is or somebody else thinks, but what he is telling you. Try your best. That's your shield. And that's how to get guided. Simple as that. So I'll pray for you and ask Allah to guide you and hope that you'll find what you're looking for. I mean, anybody else? <coughs> yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf, it's, uh, first of all, I'd like to say how, um, how much of a pleasure it is to have you here in Dubai. Um, and I'll try to keep my questions uh, short and, and easy for you. Uh, I'd like to pass on a couple of questions that I constantly get from uh, my non-Muslim friends. Uh, let's say, first of all, uh, why should women cover up? As, uh, as, you know, as short and plain and simple as that. Why is it? What's the purpose? Um, what good comes to the society from women covering up? So this is the first one. The second one is, um, I get some of my non-Muslim friends saying that they think it's demeaning for women to be, have to, to be a responsibility of a male in her life throughout her life. First of all, she's responsible, she's the responsibility of, of her father, then the responsibility of her husband. If she has no husband, she's the responsibility of her brother, her son perhaps, later on in life. And some people say that they think it's demeaning for women. So, what are your comments on that? Just one second, Shane, before you start. It's your prerogative, you take questions. Please keep the questions on topic again, and just one question at a time, please. Sheikh, if you want to answer, it's up to you. Esmaq? My name is uh, Diyā. 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 Diyā al-Din. The gardens of the religion? Uh, actually, Diyā is synonymous with Noor. Oh, know, oh, oh. Diyā. I thought you said Riyab. No, no, no. Diyā. Shaq <laughs> Light of the Deen. Like Noor al-Din. MashaAllah. Where are you from, Aki? Uh, Egypt. Aunt Min Mas? Yeah, we figured that. Aunt Saidi? <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. No problem. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know it's, it's, not, uh, it's not an insult, but uh, I'm not. I don't look even Saidi. Zakalak here, Habibi. First is Saida. There were two questions that our brother asked us about related to our sisters. The first question is, uh, I think, probably one of the most obvious in the whole world. But it came to me the first time that, that somebody hit me with it was a lady. She was a professor in the university where I was giving a talk. And she didn't hear any of what I said. She just had walked in the door at a particular moment during the question and answer period. And with no microphone or anything, she just walked in the middle of the room and pointed at the ladies, pointed at our sisters, and she said, why are they dressed like that? <laughs> I couldn't believe she did that, you know? I said, excuse me? Why are they dressed like that? And then I realized I'm on my own, you know? Because I don't have anything that really, that I'd ever studied that said how to answer a question that way. So I trust the law. And I said, Tawakal to Allah. Allah, give me the answer. What came in my mind, and this is what I do all the time anyway, I just take what comes in my mind, and hopefully Allah will accept that. Because when we start, we say, Bismillah, and we hope it's going to be from Allah, right? So, said, excuse me, ma'am, but what's wrong with the way they're dressed? I want to know why they're dressed like that. I said, what's the matter with that? Is it something you don't like? Yes! I said, it doesn't fit your logic. That's right. It's not logical. Good. So then my question is easy. Now, for you, why are you dressed at all? <laughs> what? I said, why are you dressed at all? I beg your pardon. It's not nice to beg, but <laughs> I'm asking you, 
Why are you wearing any clothes? Because according to logic, you were born without any clothes, right? You didn't have any clothes on when you came into the world. You were naked, in the buff, nude, right? So why are you wearing any clothes at all? She lost it right there. And really high-pitched scream. Modesty! Oh. Now ask the ladies with the covering on why they're dressed like that. They'll give you the exact same answer. There's no difference. They will say the word you said, modesty. The difference is you decided what modesty was when you put your clothes on this morning. And by the way, she was covered all the way to her wrist and all the way to her ankles. She was, strangely enough. I said, you decided what was modesty when you got dressed. These ladies let their Lord and Creator tell them what modesty was. That's the difference. Next question. Boom. The next question we have now that our brother's asking us about is the role of the woman. And the way the question's presented even should give it away before we come to the idea of this demeaning word that he kept throwing in there. This is an offer. It's a commandment on the men to take care of the women. But if for whatever reason she doesn't want it, well, duh! Can a woman file for divorce, yes or no? Yes. Okay. Oh, what's your next question? If she doesn't want to be married to somebody, then what? If she doesn't want someone to care for her, love her, make her the queen of the house, if she doesn't want to have an easy way to go when it comes to a lot of the things that many women in the street would love to have from a Muslim man, then it's her choice. There's nothing in Islam forcing women to enjoy the benefits. <laughs> Next question. Right. Sisters in the middle. Sisters in the middle. Yeah. Oh yes, we have a sister. Salam alaikum, sister. Salam alaikum. It's an honor to be talking to you right now, sir. My name is Sundas and I'm currently a student and uh, I study with lots of non-Muslims and uh, I'm faced many times with the question, if there's a God, why are there bad things in this world? I love that question. <laughs> I love that question. You know why I love that question? Because I used to have the same question. And anything and everything I looked at never answered that question until I came to Islam. That for me is one of the clearest proofs. If you really want to use your brain and think about what's going on around you and think about religion and a belief pattern or system, really you need to look at Islam. You really need to look at it because it's the only one that gives you the answer. Because Islam never demands from you blind faith. Never. The only thing we are told in Islam, the only restriction don't try to imagine what Allah is like. Don't imagine what Allah looks like. Don't get into that area because you can't. You'll, just, just, you'll destroy your own brain. Other than that, ask. And on our website, watch out, here comes a commercial. On our website, islamnewsroom.com, we have that article featured more times maybe than almost anything else. If there's a God... Why all of this chaos in the world? And that's our subject today, isn't it? All this chaos in the world. Tornadoes. Earthquakes. We have an earthquake page on that same website. All about earthquakes. It updates every few minutes. You can see where the earthquakes are right now. And they have increased in intensity, just like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said they would. Tremendous number of earthquakes today. Several hundred earthquakes have happened since I've been giving you this speech right now. Go there and check it out. Along with that, pestilence, violence, wars, occupations, and I'm not talking about jobs. 
and family abuse. Serious problems. We even talked about a few of them, didn't we? Serious stuff. So if there's a gun, why is all that stuff happening? It means the person asking the question doesn't even have the basic understanding of what Islam taught. Islam never taught us that this was the Jannah. Huh. What? You thought you were in paradise? Is that what you thought? Look what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. He summed it up with one of the simplest, most beautiful little teachings you could ever imagine. When it comes to why do bad things happen to good people, that's how I titled the, the lecture about this originally years ago. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Adunya signal movement. What genital kafir. This material existence that we're in called Hayat to dunya, life of this world, is a prison to a true believer. But it's the only paradise to a disbeliever. He narrowed it down to two things, believers and disbelievers. We know as believers that this is the hardest thing we're going to go through. Because when this is over, that's it. It's done. It's done. You're not going to be put in any more tests. But you start seeing the results of the tests. You know how that goes. But for the disbeliever, this is their paradise. And that's why they want so desperately to build the big things here. And the fancy cars, the beautiful homes, the best of clothes. You know what I'm saying? You know, stretch your stuff, baby. Okay. <laughs> this is what they're looking for. But our Prophet Sallallahu he told us, and this is another hadith, to clarify it even more. Because some of the companions were concerned about the same thing that you're concerned about with your question. He said two people would be brought on the Day of Judgment. One of them, he had everything he asked for in this life. Even to the extent when he was dying, he wanted a feast set before him, and he got it. The other person, he didn't get anything he asked for. Even to the extent when he was about to die, all he asked for was just a drink of water. And he didn't even get that. Now on the day of judgment, the one who had everything, he would be pushed into the hellfire. Like you put a needle in something and pull it out. Just in that instant, whoop, whoop. And then, it's not in the Hadith. That, well, well, it's not there. <laughs> Don't look for that. He would be asked, in your whole life, remember, he had everything. In your whole life, did you ever see any good? He'd say, well, Allah, in my whole life, I never saw anything good. It wiped it all out. The other man that had nothing, suffered in this life, would be put into paradise. <laughs> like you put a pin in something and pull it out. And then he would be asked, in your whole life, did you ever see anything bad? He would say, well, why? In my whole life, I never saw anything bad. No hardships. So the companions, still not quite satisfied with that one, they said, yeah, but, okay, so why this guy who had everything has to go to hell and why the other guy goes to paradise? Wrong. Oh. And Prophet Sallallahu made it real clear. Nobody's perfect. Well, <laughs> yeah, duh. <laughs> I'm one of those not perfect guys. He said that nobody is perfectly good and nobody's perfectly bad. The man who had everything in this life, actually he was a very bad person. Allah hated him. So we don't have that concept, by the way. God is love and he loves everything and everybody no matter how bad they are. No, 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 no. We know that God is the loving al-wadud and ready to love anything and everything that is good, but he's also capable of dealing it out heavy duty 
and you don't want to know about that. So this man who Allah hated, who had done so many monstrously bad things to people, yet he did some good deeds. So Allah paid him in this life for his good deeds. So he would not even smell the paradise. That he could be thrown directly right straight into hell. The other man, this gentleman, actually was very good. And Allah loved him. But he did some bad things. He made some mistakes. But because Allah doesn't want him to even smell the hellfire, not even for a nanosecond. So Allah let him have his punishment here in this dunya so that he could go straight into the paradise. Stop and think about it. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't there really need to be a, jay, a day of judgment? Because otherwise, how could any of us look at the things that are going on around us again and again and again and see how the tyrants and the aggressors and the oppressors throughout history again and again and again, not only do they win these battles and wars, but they go away with all the spoils of wars. Well, the really good people, the honest, kind, giving, generous, charity-giving people are suffering. Literally starving to death. But that's because this is a dunya. How many of you know what the word dunya really means? Raise your hand. You really know where it comes from? What's the source? Ah, something really low. Really low in a base. Something so disgusting, right? Somebody would go, oh man, I've got dunya on my shoe. <laughs> low. And that's what this universe is to Allah. How low? And again, we don't say, for Allah so loved the world. We don't have that. That's not our concept. Why do these people get these big this and big that and oh, 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 you see people of the West doing so and so and so. Muslims out here just, you know, for food, trying their best, right? But look at this. Prophet Sallallahu said it to his companions so they'd understand. If the universe and everything in it, hayat the dunya wa ma fiha, everything in this universe was even worth a wing, a wing of a mosquito to Allah, then he would never give those bad people a sip of water to drink. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now we understand, this is not our paradise. This is our chance to earn paradise, work for paradise, and get the mercy of Allah so we can go to paradise. Well, this is not our paradise. So when you see the bad things happening to the people here, just remember, the ones who are suffering the most here have the best chance to go to paradise. And those who have everything here, they have the least chance. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it sure ruins your opportunities. So this is why Muslims are constantly encouraging each other to whatever you do, do it with a good intention for the sake of others. Now, some people will say, oh, wow, look the look way they spent their money. Last night we were down in Abu Dhabi. Have you seen the big masjid down there? That's an amazing place. And the people could say, oh, wow, look, they wasted their money. How do you say that? Why would you say that? How many people go there? Even tourists go there and want to know about it. They learn about Islam. And it's a big place to worship. How many of you have been there? Were you impressed? Yes or no? You're impressed or something big. It's amazing. By the way, it must be pretty impressive. I didn't even say the name of it. You know which one I meant, didn't you? Huh? So see, when Muslims do something, at least they put a good intention with it. Something, hopefully, that Allah will accept. And we know we make mistakes along the way. But at least, inshallah, God can forgive us. Because we never made partners with him in our worship. And what did Allah say about that? You didn't ask this question, but I'd like to throw it out there. What did Allah say about this in the Quran? Chapter 4, verse 48. This chapter called Women, on nisa Here's what Allah said. He doesn't forgive people setting up partners with him in worship, but anything else, he can forgive it. So the idea of 
making partners with Allah in worship. This is the worst thing in this test that we're in. Have you said, well, this is a good person. He's good to you. He's a nice guy, nice to you. But he's not being very nice to Allah. He's not being good to Allah if he made partners with him in worship or denied Allah's ayahs, his proofs. So that's the way I would answer that question. I think uh, if there was any good in that, it was from Allah. Any mistakes, of course, are from myself. Thank you very much for that. On my right side, alhamdulillah. Two more shahada, Sheikh. Hmm? So you, you, you sat down too early. Somebody else wants to do shahada? Yes, on the right oh. side. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name, brother? Name. Leonardo. 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 It's nice to have you with us yeah. today. You're wearing a shirt that says Peace of the World. That's similar to some other countries I've heard that they said they wanted their piece of the world. <laughs> oh, oh, it's spelled different. That's right. Okay, anyhow. It's nice to have you with us today. Thanks. So, are you ready to accept Islam? Mm. No. Have they, yes. uh, have yes. they explained yes. to yes, you yes, we yes. believe there's only one God? Yes. yes. And Muhammad's his messenger? Yes. yes. Okay. So you repeat after me. Okay. I swear. I swear. I swear. I swear. There's only one God. Uh, only repeat. one God. Yeah, only one, one guy. Yeah. Allah. Allah. And, Allah. And, and, and Muhammad. Muhammad. His messenger. Is the messenger. Perfect. Okay. Now Arabia. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An la ilaha. Allah. Allah. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. Wa. Wa. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Anna Muhammad. Anna Muhammad. 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 Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Very good. Very oh, good. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Who, who is uh, with our brother? You're with him. He, he understands in his language. Yes. You sure? Yeah, okay. I'm very I want to be sure of this. Take good care of him now. It's on you now, man. <laughs> MashaAllah. Well, as long as we're up, anybody else? Who here? I gotta stop doing that. Who here, guys, listen to me, gals. If you have never done this before publicly and you're saying to yourself, you know, I wish I could do that, but everybody else is gonna look at me funny. Do you really care what other people think about you? No. Do you really care? Isn't it more important what you think about yourself on the day of judgment? And to make it real easy for you, all of us who believe in the law already, we're going to get up. Get up. Don't make me come down there. <laughs> if you already believe in the law, get up. All right. Now, see how much easier it's going to be for you? Nobody's going to hardly notice it. And this is going to work good for all of the Muslims who never made their shahada yet. <coughs> So all we're going to do now is just tell you, if you really believe there's one God and you really want to worship him on his terms, that's your first step. What you do after that, that's up to you. But if you don't believe this, then please sit back down. Because this is not a game. As much as I joke around, this is not a joke. And whoever says this with sincerity in their heart, our prayers are with them that Allah will always guide them. Guide them to the very, very best. So if you're ready, stand up now and just repeat this with me. I'm going to have to do English first and then attempt some Arabic. You can go along with me. But remember, it's what's in your heart that counts more than what's coming out of your mouth. So keep it clean and pure for your Allah in your heart. I swear, I swear. There, is no there is no God to worship except one God, except one God. Allah. Allah. And I swear, Muhammad is his messenger. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu an Muhammad 
رسول اللہ اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر جزاکم اللہ خیر we had a great time with all of you tonight and we ask the Lord to accept from all of us and all of you please if this is your first time make shahada like this you want to get some help as you leave out of here they have some gifts for you as a matter of fact they're right outside this door I'm going to be out there checking about that right now come out and give us salams before you go and until we can be together again my prayers with you hope you pray for us for this guidance Edina Saratul Mustaqim wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah